This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 117, recorded January 21st, 2011. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and this is TWIV, the podcast where we talk all about viruses. Joining me today from North Central Florida is Rich Condit. Hello, Vincent. How are you this evening? Or no, afternoon. What is it? It's afternoon, yes. We're How in the you? same time zone, uh, yeah. Rich. Right. Well, I, I, maybe you are. I'm all over the place. <laughs> I am uh, covered with snow again. We had a little snowfall here in the New York area. Well, my heart bleeds for you. No, it's okay. You spent your time in Buffalo, I understand. I did my time. Mm. Today we have a uh, special TWIV. Our guest is the author of a newly published book entitled The Panic Virus, and his name is Seth Manukin. Welcome to TWIV, Seth. Uh, thank you so much. It's, I'm, I'm a fan of the podcast. It's great to be here. I'm really glad you agreed to spend some time with us with a book with that title. How could you not, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So we want to talk about your book and all the issues surrounding it. But I wanted to just ask a little bit about your background, because our listeners are always interested. And I noticed that in college you majored in what you call history and science. Yes. So maybe you uh, could explain to us. Uh, oh, we've lost Rich. Let me get him back. He wasn't, con he wasn't contributing much anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I pushed the wrong button. <laughs> oh, we did that. We wanted to get rid of you. Oh, okay. I just asked Seth... Uh, Tell us about majoring in history and science. Right. Well, it was, um, when I went to college, it, it actually was a much less popular area of study than it is now. I think in the last decade or so, it's, it's something that has, uh, that has taken off to some extent. But um, I ended up, I, I, I chose it really because it was the closest thing I could find to uh, sort of a, a general liberal arts education. Um, I, I wanted to uh, essentially study the same types of things I was studying in high school and, uh, you know, learn biology along with history and philosophy and, um, and, and literature. Uh, and the, the history of science requirement um, really allowed uh, for for a lot of interdisciplinary study. So that was how I, I ended up there. So it's history of science, not history and science. It's not a dual well, major, in other it words. No, it's not a dual major. It actually was called, and I think still is called, where uh, history and science, that was the technical name. But okay. Uh, okay. yeah, it, it really was um, a history of science. Because when I went to college, which was much earlier than you, I went to Cornell and they are... There was a program in the history of science there, right? And the chair was L. Pierce Williams, right? You know that name? Yes, yes. And I was amazed. This was 1970, I believe. And I said, "Why?" So I was going to be a science major. I said, "Why would anyone want to study the history of science?" Of course, I was a young guy back then, and I didn't understand. But now I understand. So, do you get? Do you take science courses also? Uh, yeah, not anymore. <laughs> not anymore, but in college. Although, so. <laughs> yes, I did. Yes, um, uh, I did. I took, uh, and, and the way it worked was you needed to specialize in uh, or choose one area of science that you really focused on and, and then uh, sort of a history of science area. Mm -hmm. um, and so I did uh, genetics and evolutionary biology is, is my science. Um, and then really did a lot of 20th century Soviet science history for my, for my history. So it was, uh, that was a little bit um, all over the place. And then I wrote my thesis about uh, axe murderers in the 19th century. So um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I covered a lot. Wow. So where was this? This was at ha Harvard. Yeah. Yeah. Um so I, in your book, you're pretty good at understanding a lot of scientific issues, and I guess that is in part that that education, right? Um, I, I, yes, in part. I mean, I, I think the big thing that I learned uh, at, at the time in college was that um, 
it's good I did not decide to be a scientist. <laughs> um, because now, why do you uh, say that? That's interesting. Just because um, it it was so it took so much effort for me to um, really wrap my head around things that a lot of the people I was in class with um, I think got on a much more intuitive level. Um, I, and part of that was undoubtedly just because not having gone through a whole science track, um, you know, I, I didn't have the same grounding, but, uh, I, I just found I didn't have the mathematical, the sort of innate mathematical abilities, um, uh, to, to, to do a lot of that. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so, so, uh, but one thing I did, I, I do think I really learned was, the importance of communicating difficult scientific concepts to people who uh, are not professional scientists. Um, and, and more than anything else, I think that's what I carried to this project from, from college. But um, I, I, I really almost felt like a lot of this was going back to school. I mean, I, I actually used um, a, a good number of my old textbooks uh, because I felt that if one of the themes that I wanted to address was the importance of um, the media being able to to understand and communicate science um, in a responsible way, and the importance of the of the public being able to have sort of a basic discourse about science, um, it was really paramount on me to feel like I could discuss all of the different issues that arose um, with a really significant degree of comfort. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear from, from people who are scientists that, uh, that, that there were no glaring errors that you found. No, I, looked, I didn't see I looked, any. I looked, believe me. <laughs> right, I yeah. didn't see any. It, 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 uh, it was real solid. No, it was very good. And I, I think uh, your science background must have really helped there. Is this the first science writing that you have done? Uh, yeah, it's really the first. Um, it's sort of the first time that I have have used my education in my professional life, and I and I think that uh, it it probably has completely shifted the the direction of my work. It, it's hard for me to imagine now not doing this type of work going forward. So how, um, how did you pick this topic? So it, it, almost by accident, it was something I started work on this about three years ago, and um, I, I became interested in it just because the issue of vaccines um, and vaccine safety was one that kept coming up among people that I knew, um, uh, among my peers and 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 my friends, and um, I was very surprised that in those discussions they indicated that they were making decisions in their own lives and for their own children based on a sort of gut instinct um, and, and not on uh, what they felt like was was the scientific evidence. Um, and that that was such a contrast to how these same people viewed other areas of, of their day-to-day -day lives that science affected. Um, uh, climate change is, is the, is the, was sort of the most obvious one to me. Uh, these were people who, in general, were, were incredibly uh, not only dismissive, but, but really um, had a, a derisive attitude towards people who did not accept um, the, the majority of the evidence that human beings are contributing to climate change. Um, and at the same time, they were making a decision about, uh, about and arguably uh, something involving science that, that arguably affected them in much more personal ways um, based on, on uh, not on the evidence. So there's a real disconnect. Yes, it, it, was, it was a real disconnect. And, and it also seemed to me to, to be um, illustrative of... Uh, something that was going on in society more generally. Um, uh, and and in, in the book, I, I talk about Stephen Colbert's coining of the term truthiness, um, which, you know, I think, I think he defined as, as, uh, as knowing with your heart uh, as opposed to with your mind. Um, and I think that is something that we see n not just with this issue, but, uh, you know, we, we saw that with the birther movement. Um, where people just 
believed or felt that Obama uh, was not born in America, and and that drove their conviction. Um, and, and so I, I became interested in that as as sort of a wider sociological uh, phenomena. Hmm. So the name is obviously a, a play on the situation, right? Uh, you, the the title of the book, the Panic Virus. Yeah. Yes. I mean, and and I think it, it also. I mean, I think one thing that that we've learned, and again, not just from this, is that um, it's very hard to unscare people. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I think the the media needs to really be responsible and much more responsible than they have been um, about uh, uh, about what they report. Um, and, and about and about making sure that when they report a potential controversy, uh, there's enough there to justify their making this a story. I think that's that's something that we have touched on so many times here on Twitter. We have Alan Dove usually with us, who's a science writer, right? And he has a great perspective about this, and he's talked about all the reasons why. But in the end, you don't need to have an excuse for getting it wrong. You should just make sure you get it right. Right. So uh, I don't think that we've uh, told our listeners yet the summary of what the book is actually about. And we ought to, I think, do that. That's, I think that's because they've all bought and read it. <clears throat> oh, is that it? Oh, okay, so it's not necessary. Good. <laughs> so I, I want to make sure everybody's on the same page. No, right, no, no. So it's, uh, 25 have, words or less. For, 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 the, for those people who, who haven't, um, uh, uh, it, it's, it's real. What, it, what the book um, does, or what I tried to do with it, is take the narrative um, of, of the vaccine scares of the last 15 or 20 years and, and really specifically um, the kind of dual or twinned concerns that the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine um, causes autism and the fear that uh, vaccines that contained a mercury-based preservative called thimerosal uh, caused autism. Use the narrative of, of those fears and the repercussions of those fears um, as a way to look at that issue, obviously, but also our relationship um, culturally and uh, as a society to uh, truth and to science um, and how that affects us. Um, I, I think when I started out, uh, well, first, I should say when I started out, I, I actually didn't know what side the the sort of evidence supported. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I, and I had no dog in the hunt. Um, I, I don't. Uh, no one in my family works for a drug company, and no one in my family, direct families, is is, uh, is affected by autism. So um, uh, it started out really as as an intellectual uh, project or, or inquiry for me. Um, it became one that was much more, uh, that I felt very personally about, um, over time. And, uh, I talked to a lot of parents whose children died of vaccine preventable diseases. And, um, I, you know, I think that that is something that as a society, uh, in 21st century America, we should be ashamed of. Um, and I talked with a lot of parents who, uh, who, who are dealing with really incredibly difficult situations uh, with, with children with autism. And, and I think that in general, families dealing with, with families with children with serious developmental disorders um, do not get the, the help and support that, that they need and deserve. One of the things that was surprising to me was in the beginning of your book, you go through a little bit of history uh, of anti-vaccine sentiments, and they've gone back quite far. Yes, yes. It, I, it, and, and they've really been cyclical in a way. Um, not, not at the very beginning, because there was no uh, sort of precedent or, or, or history for people to know that vaccines were effective. Um, so, so there were other issues that, that arose uh, from the outset. But what has happened for, for now well over a century is that when a disease um, is, is very present in a society, when, when that virus has gotten a toehold, uh, these concerns about vaccine safety um, are very much in the background because the concerns about the disease itself are very much in the foreground. When vaccines then 
do their job essentially and, and are effective and, and a disease starts to recede um, in a population, then people that then there is more of a toehold then then these different scares can get more of a toehold because the risks of not vaccinating um, begin to feel more and more notional. As you said before, Rich, they're victim, vaccines are victims of their own success. Victims of their own success. I sent, uh, as Vincent and I were working up to this, I sent him uh, a classic uh, engraving from uh, the early 19th century that maybe you've seen, Seth. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a political cartoon or something like that. That uh, uh, describes vaccine skeptics in, in Jenner's time. And it's got right. a physician vaccinating a bunch of people and they got cows growing out of them, right. growing yes. horns and all that kind of stuff. So it was a big deal even back then. Yeah. And, and another thing you saw back then, which was which was fascinating, was um, there was a there was a religious component to it. And there was um, a, a feeling that. Uh, you know, if you got smallpox, it was because God wanted you to get smallpox. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so yeah, th there were there were a lot of different overlapping concerns. Um, uh, another thing that I found really interesting is is, uh, and I had no idea about this. Um, you know, in the United States, uh, we have mandatory vaccination laws for for school age children. Those have been weakened significantly um, uh, over the past several years, and and now many states have what's known as uh, quote philosophical exemption, where all you need to do is say you don't believe in giving a given vaccine, and uh, and and then you, you don't your child doesn't need to be vaccinated. But um, it, for the most part, in Europe, you don't have mandatory vaccine laws, um, and, and that dates in part, uh, at least in the UK to a series of what were called poor laws in the, in the 19th century um, and uh, a sort of revolt against those and a, and a feeling, a sentiment at the time that vaccination was something that was you, that, that where the upper classes were using that to control the lower classes. Um, uh, so it was a really interesting example of how Different, different currents, um, uh, political currents, sociological currents in society have enormous long-term repercussions, uh, you know, decades and centuries later. And in this, in this country, there's, you know, we're fiercely independent. Uh, and so it seems to me that there's, uh, you're, you're asking for resistance anytime you try and impose anything on the whole population. Just look right. at the healthcare legislation recently. I mean, right. the, one of the biggest objections to that is you can't make me do this. Right, exactly. Although, um, you know, I, I think, again, yeah, healthcare is not totally dissimilar from this in that there is not a lot of honest rhetoric uh, or, right. or there, right. there's, there's not a lot of honest discussion about what that actually means. Right. Um, and, uh, and, you know, as a society, there are all sorts of things we say we, we allow the government to do. You know, I, I'm not allowed to, uh, to, to go and drive drunk. Um, and if I do, there, there are consequences. I'm not allowed to, uh, you know, run around starting fires. Um, uh, and, and I think that we need to, we not meaning the three of us, but um, we as a society need to realize that both with healthcare and with vaccines, that this is actually not just a personal decision. Um, you know, not having adequate health care for the country as a whole means that health care costs go up for everyone. Right. Um, a, a, you know, not vaccinating your child means that the, the child living next to you is at greater risk. Um, so I think there's, there's almost the, there's a dishonest way that that the the conversation occurs on a public level um you know almost acting as if we all live in in hermetically sealed vacuums uh and whatever we decide to do it only affects us so you think that we could ever return to a state where immunization was mandatory for all with no exceptions um no i i, I don't and i and i think that actually it's it's going to be uh, I think it's unlikely that even the, the philosophical exemption laws that have been passed over the last several years uh, are, are, are changed. I think that what 
if in in order for this situation to change, what needs to happen is um, the public discussion needs to change. Um, there needs to be uh, an awareness of what the risks of not vaccinating are. And unfortunately, we have lots of examples of of the risks because, um, you know, there are kids dying. Uh, Ten kids died of whooping cough last year in California. Um, uh, so we can say this is a potential risk of, of not vaccinating. Um, I, I also, you know, really, really believe that my industry, the media, um, needs to be honest with, we need to be honest with ourselves about the effects of our reporting. Um, and we need to be more responsible when, when we're dealing with issues like this. Um, uh, and I, and I think that's something that could also make a big difference. So it, this strikes me as a as a real dilemma. As a as a journalist, you've got uh, people doing reasoned science on the one hand and coming up with uh, conclusions about the relationship between vaccines and possible relationship between vaccines and autism and that kind of stuff. And then you right. have uh, people on the other hand who are using the mommy instinct, right? Right. right. And uh, and who, frankly have it wrong. Right. So did they, do you have to give them airtime? And if so, how do you wind up presenting the truth? Okay. Cause they're not telling the truth. Right. Uh, well, uh, I mean, one thing that, uh, that I think it's important or, or at least I feel is important to, to address and, and discuss is that, um, I think they, Parents who believe that their children have been harmed um, absolutely believe that they're telling the truth. I, right. I and 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 I and I, you know, I talked to literally hundreds of them, and I, I never doubted um, their sincerity. And I think this is a debate in which it, it's very easy for um, both, you know, quote, sides to demonize the other. And, and that makes it really, really difficult to then have a conversation. I mean, I, I was just uh, doing doing an online chat and um, the, the people who clearly felt that I had, that I was wrong, um, you know, those comments were, uh, and, and this is some of the gentler ones, you know, um, your nose is growing, you're pushing poison. Why don't you admit all the funding you've gotten from drug companies? Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure what my response is supposed to be to that. Um, but, uh, uh the, to your question about how do we present that, you know, for some reason, I think me in, in, in science and medicine, there's a sense that, we need to present anything that comes up in, under the guise of, um, of of sort of being objective and uh, and doing this on the one hand on the other hand thing and and I think that's crap essentially I mean uh, you know we don't do that in coverage of business um, you know if I came on here and said uh, hey guess what guys I am about to buy Exxon. Um, you know, later in the day, it's, this is a hot news tip. You wouldn't then go and run with that and run that alongside someone saying, you know, that the head of Exxon saying, actually, we've never heard of this guy and, and he's not about to buy us. Um, uh, and if you did run that, I, I think two things would happen. One, you would lose credibility with, with your listeners and two, your peers, um, or, or let's say for, you know, a minute that you or the New York times or, or whomever your peers would, would absolutely think that, that y you were irresponsible and, and had, had, uh, were, were a moron essentially that we don't have that same standard when it comes to science and medicine. Um, you know, instead you can say something that is fairly outrageous, um, present, you know, a, a handful of people, um, and then get airtime. Uh, and, and when you then, when you set up that dynamic and you have, you know, Jenny McCarthy and, uh, an official from the CDC on, on the other side, it, it appears and sounds like. It's essentially, you know, two camps, half of whom think one thing and half of whom think the other. Uh, and, and, and to accurately 
present that story, what you would need to do is is you know have Jenny McCarthy on one side, um, and 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 thousands and thousands of scientists and and public health officials, and uh, on the other. Um, so you know, I think there's a way to do this that that is not uh, exercising self censorship. It's it's just exercising um, due diligence and 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 good judgment. So then, do you? Uh, use the model that you gave of, say, business reporting or something like that, when somebody comes in and uh, makes what seems to be a an unreasonable claim, you check their credibility, and if they don't have any credibility, they don't get any airtime. Well, or, you know, I mean, let's, I'll use as, as, uh, um, as, what what us what, what the media would say is an example and and uh, and what you might say is a case study um, <laughs> uh, which is uh you know Andrew Wakefield's 1998 paper in the Lancet um, in, in which he first posited this this connection between uh, the MMR vaccine and um, gut disorders and then gut disorders with autism so let let's just look at that um, you know, that ran in the Lancet. Uh, it ran in the Lancet along with a uh, disclaimer on every page that it was an early report. Uh, it also ran in the Lancet alongside a commentary which absolutely eviscerated it. Um, and, uh, you know, anyone who reads medical journals knows that when you run a commentary, it's usually to talk about how great a study is, not how horrible it is. So, you know, right from the outset, there were lots of indications that this was something that you should not draw conclusions, not not draw large conclusions from. Even if none of that had been there, it was uh, th- that was a case study based on twelve children, and one of the main pieces of data, one of the main data points, was parents after the fact recollection. So. Any journalist who was versed at all in, in, in science or knew anything about how experimentation works would know that a 12-person case study based on after-the-fact recollections is not the type of thing that you can draw any conclusions from. Um, and so what I would argue should have been the story the day after he held a press conference recommending that parents avoid giving the MMR vaccine to their children is – what in the hell is this guy doing up there saying this? And why is his hospital, his employer, giving him a platform to do this? Um, I think that would have been an, an, a very obvious story to do and, and would not have meant that all of the reporters who were at that press conference had to then go and, and, you know, and, and research the issue for uh, weeks on end on themselves. Um, instead, what you saw the next day was lots of, you know, prominent researcher from the Royal Free Hospital uh, recommends parents hold off on, on the MMR vaccine. Um, and, you know, I think, I think it was, it should have been easy and obvious and apparent as to, as to why that was uh, both incorrect and, and, and irresponsible. So, so that requires reporters who are savvy relative to the science and who uh, understand their obligation to report this accurately and do it. I mean, yes and no. I, you know, again, I don't think that, that understanding about a case, uh, a case study and what you can and can't, what conclusions you can and can't draw from that and, and, uh, understanding about the, the reliability of, of, you know, what's, what's essentially eyewitness testimony. Um, and we know there are lots of problems with eyewitness testimony. You know, I, I don't think that is something that requires a huge amount of of um, of advanced expertise or specialized knowledge. I think you know if you are a a, a science reporter or a medical reporter, um, that's a sort of basic level of 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 competence and comprehension that you should have. It, you know, but let's say that reporters don't have that. Um, our industry is being decimated, and uh, science reporters are being laid off. Um, I, I think that it is absolutely imperative that there at least be an editor on staff that understands those things. Because really, if you think about it, one editor uh, can you know make ten good reporters. 
um, and, and and any major news outlet, I don't think it's too much to ask them to have one person that serves as the sort of gatekeeper um, when you're covering science and, and health and medicine and who knows enough about these basic concepts to be able to flag, uh, you know, the latest press release that, that lands on their table. Um, and I think that's all you would have needed then. You know, one, one editor combined with the, the, the sort of uh, self-control or, or realization or whatever you want to say that, that um, if they concluded that, that this wasn't reliable, then they shouldn't run with it. Were there any journalists who got it right? The Wakefield paper? Uh, I mean, the, they're in, in the daily news reports that I saw, um, that I read, and, and I read most of them, I didn't, uh, there were no stories I came across that were the where the next day or even that week's story where the focus was um it's ridiculous that we're paying this attention to him uh you know it, it's it's irresponsible of us to 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 uh to be giving this this attention so um no certainly over time there were people who uh were were began to be more skeptical um but I, I actually think there really has never been an honest reckoning of why the coverage from right off the bat was 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 so bad. Um, not that not wrong, but bad. You know, the problem was uh, exacerbated by a number of scientists who stood up for the story, uh, as you know. Well, I mean, the, he he did have twelve co-authors. Um, uh, or 11 co-authors, either, either there were 12 or 13 total, uh, authors on the paper. Um, uh, but you know, at the press conference that, that the Royal Free Hospital, um, organized for this, he was on, there were, there were five people, um, up at, at the dais or whatever who were, who were there. And, uh, and, and the other people there we're not supporting him. In fact, the dean of of the the Royal Free School of Medicine, uh, you know, really became livid that that he was saying this. They had discussed beforehand, um, uh, you know, what they thought was an appropriate message, uh, and he eventually started banging his uh, his shoe on the table. It was sort of a, a, a Khrushchevian uh, <laughs> moment there. Um, so, so, you know, again, I mean, even, you know, take, take away the, the case study and the post-factor recollections, all of that. And you had the, the dean of the medical school, you know, basically shouting at this press conference saying, this is wrong. You know, this is crazy. If people come away from this thinking that they shouldn't vaccinate, uh, you know, kids are going to start dying. Um, so it, 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 it's not as if the people surrounding him, uh, were, were saying, oh yeah, we agree that, uh, that, that it is, it is judicious and responsible of him to start making these vast public health recommendations. Um, yeah. So, so. since, since then Wakefield, the paper has been retracted. Wakefield lost his, his license to practice. And now Brian Deere has shown that. Uh, it, it was a incredibly contrived situation, yet Wakefield continues to defend himself, and he was, I understand he was on ABC TV the other night. So I just maybe you can explain why he is doing this in the face of clear evidence that he's wrong. You know, I mean, it, this is it's something that's come up uh, a lot, obviously, over the last couple of weeks, and and um, I, you know, I I can't speculate as to anyone's motives and certainly not to, uh, to, to, to Andrew Wakefield's motives. Um, uh, you know, he, he refused to appear on, on CNN if I was there. Uh, so, you know, he, he clearly disagrees with me and, and I, I disagree with him. Um, but, uh, I think it's safe to say at this point that he's not about to, to change his mind and, and he's not about to, uh, to acknowledge any of the criticisms against him. Um, my question is, why was he on ABC? Um, you know, why was he on CNN? Um, and in fact, I, you know, I, I was on CNN and, and I was on ABC. Um, uh, but I'm not sure why we are giving him the airtime now. I mean, we've known that 
that study was unreliable and and unsupportable for a decade. Um, I, I haven't seen any of those uh, any of those broadcasts. Was he uh, seriously challenged by the people yes, it, uh, interviewing him? Absolutely. And both of them, uh, Anderson Cooper and, and George Stephanopoulos, um, were very, very tough on him uh, in, in both instances. Um, however, uh, the result is still that he gets a chance to go on TV and make his case that this is a huge conspiracy against him, that uh, this is all stemming from Brian Deere, who, who he paints as sort of a, a Javert-type obsessed um, uh, you know, uh, uh, obsessed with tracking Wakefield down. Um, and, uh, I think for a certain number of people, um, they're going to see that and they're going to have one of several reactions. One, you know, maybe he's right. Um, two, haven't we heard about this, you know, eight times over the, over the past several years and every time the the takeaway is this is something that has been completely discredited. But if it's been completely discredited all these times, why is it coming up again? And and I think for some people and some people I've talked to, they, they feel like, well, you know, there must be something to this. If if it if year after year we keep seeing it on the news and and saying, you know, oh, this time it's been totally discredited. Um to me it doesn't I, I don't really care whether that initial paper was the result of fraud or incompetence or fraudulent incompetence or, uh, uh, you know, he, he was out to make money or whatever. Um, it was bad science and, uh, and, and we shouldn't be paying attention to it. We shouldn't be discussing it. Um, you know, if, if Good Morning America wanted to do a segment on, uh, on these latest fraud charges, um, I think they could have done a segment on, uh, you know, the scientist who started this scare was just accused of fraud. And let's look at some of the repercussions of, of this over the past decade. Um, you know, let's talk to a family whose infant died of, of whooping cough. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, let's look at how much it costs to contain a measles outbreak. Um, you know, I, I think that would have been a, a better way to cover this story. Which is what you've done in your book, basically. I, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded like it to me, absolutely. <laughs> so uh, I want to go back for a minute because you said you gave an example of, say, the difference between business reporting. Right. Uh, where this kind of stuff uh, would seem crazy or wouldn't happen. Right. And science and health reporting where you're seeing some of this. Um, why the difference? Um. I I think there there are a couple of reasons. One, I think uh, science is something that is is you know as as we sort of talked about in the beginning, um, it's not always easy to grasp and it's not always easy to explain. Um, you know, I think one very basic concept that people have a problem with is the inability to prove a negative. Um, and, and so when you get someone saying, uh, you know. Prove to me that vaccines don't cause autism. Um, that's not how you do science. You know, the same way I, if I said, prove to me that tomorrow when I wake up, I will not be able to fly. Uh, you know, all you can say is no human being has ever been able to fly. We're relatively confident that uh, you're not going to be the first one tomorrow morning. Um, and that's why we, we feel comfortable saying that human beings can't fly. Uh, you know, I think journalists and the public have a hard time with that concept. And so it's, it's easy in a sort of soundbite or a 500 word news story to make something seem that it, it is more, uh, legitimate or plausible or likely than it actually is. Um, uh, another thing is, you know, I used to work at Newsweek, and we had a, a sort of joke that uh, the three topics that, that we always wanted on the cover were um, babies, religion, and health. Uh, right. you know, th those were what people were drawn to. And in fact, the, the ultimate cover would be um, Jesus cures children of cancer. Um, uh, but, but, you know, so, so when you deal with health and when you deal with children – it's something that people respond to on a very emotional level, right. um, understandably. 
and uh, I, I think that's one reason that 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 we see this happening so much in in this subject where we don't see it happening um, in business, for instance. And you know, you I, I think politics is is a good parallel. Uh, people feel very emotional about politics, and so a lot of times you'll have stories. Um, where a politician makes a claim that's demonstrably untrue. Um, and instead of that being the story, the story is, you know, politician A says that, uh, you know, the Democrats are all a, a secret cabal um, uh, a, a intent on, on, on joining forces with communist China. And uh, the Democrats say that's not true. Well, you know, that's just not that's not a responsible way to go about covering covering politics any more than it is medicine or or, or science. We had a, uh, as you'll recall, an incident uh, here, I guess, just last summer with the uh, Terry Jones going to burn the Koran. Right. Yes. Exactly. Right. Outrageous. I, I, that, that's that, that's a, that's a, that's an absolutely perfect example. So um, I guess emotional topics, topics that really get people emotionally charged up. Uh, are susceptible to this. Well, I, I think they're susceptible to it because uh, because the media is susceptible to being sucked in by them. You know, there there had been other examples of of people burning the Quran um, in this country. Uh, you know, the, the, this he, it, with Terry Jones, you had someone who is very good at playing the media um, and, and very good at getting attention. And so you had, you know, I mean, when you think about it, it is, it's, it's laughable. You had this guy who, with a tiny number of followers who was, who was disavowed even by people in his own community who somehow was made to represent, uh, uh, you know, a, a debate that was supposedly going on in this country. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't like people were walking around talking about whether they should burn the Koran. <laughs> uh, you know, it was this one guy down in Tampa talking about it. So this whole problem of not being able to prove a negative in science, you, you, which you alluded to, and you talk about a lot in the book, um, it's hard to explain to people, as you say, and it's hard to explain to journalists, but there are ways. Uh, it, it takes a little hard, uh, it's, it's a little hard, as, but you make some, uh, attempts in your book. For example, one way would be, well, we can't prove that vaccines don't have side effects, but we can prove that there are no more than one in 50 million or 100 million. And on the right. other hand, I can tell you that if you don't get vaccinated, you have a one in 10 chance of getting measles if it's around. We right. have to do things like that, right, to, to, to put it in a very clear picture rather uh, than saying, you know, we can't prove the negative. That on its own is just too much fuel, I think. Yes. And, and, and I think also, you know, you need to do that and not say, not frame that as, you know, um, as, as you claim that if, if, if measles is present, you have a one in 10 chance of, of being infected. Um, you know, that's not a you claim, I claim, that's a fact. Exactly. Um, and, and we need to be comfortable, you know, saying this is a fact. Um, yeah. We don't say Apple Computer is the uh, is the largest technology company based on um, uh, uh, based on value in the in the world, uh, according to Steve Jobs. We say it as a fact because it is a fact. Right, Apple um, Inc. Apple Inc. So yes. is there right. yes. is there serious discussion uh, within the media of these issues? Because obviously this is I mean, one of your points is that this is something that the the media has to examine and, and do something about. And uh, you, so when, when you say these issues, you're not talking about um, vaccines. You're talking no, about. No, I'm talking about specifically yeah, yeah. about how you report stuff in order to, you know, really get the truth out. No, I, I don't. I don't think there is. I think it's a topic that comes up among, you know, among media geeks and and. Uh, and sort of ethics stars or, but I don't think it's a discussion uh, that that is is occurring on a widespread level. I think usually what you see is, um, you know, now reporters uh, in general are, are saying uh, are sort of taking the tack that that George Stephanopoulos and Anderson Cooper did, which is, you know, uh, this is ridiculous. Why is this guy still insisting on this? Here's everything we've learned about him, um, and. Uh, I think there, there, there really needs to be 
a a discussion, an institutional discussion um, uh, about the best way to to deal with with stories that have these type of of repercussions. And I think they're also, you know, the same way that if I decide not to vaccinate my child, I need to be honest with myself, or I don't need to be, but I should be honest with myself um, about the potential repercussions my actions are having on everyone around me and everyone my child comes in contact with. I think that we, the media as an industry, need to be honest about the repercussions of the ways in which we write about science, health, uh, politics, you know, whatever. And um, there have been very, very real repercussions of the way this story has, uh, has been presented to the public. Um, and, and I don't think it's acceptable to just say, for, for, for us as an industry, to just say, you know, it's not our job to decide what is or isn't right. We're just reporting things. We're just telling you about controversies. I think that's a cop out. So I, I, I find myself thinking, uh, so how do, how do you affect this change? And I guess the answer is you write a book. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> or at least well, that's well, one of the things you do. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, uh, would that, you know, from, from, from your words, I mean, from, 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 from your mouth to, uh, to book buyers ears, um, uh, you know, p not p books are, are not the best mass medium. Um, I think that the, uh, it, it's likely that the total number of people that, that read my book will be, uh, significantly less than the smallest market share, uh, MSNBC receives during any given day. So, um, uh, but yeah, you know, w one of the things that I, that I, I hope happens is, um, uh, I, some of these issues start to get discussed. Uh, and and get discussed in a serious way. And I know, you know, my 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 publisher, uh, I think probably um, flinches every time I I say this, but um, I I hope everyone buys my book. Obviously, uh, as does my wife. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but um, I I you know, if people don't buy it and talk about these issues, um, that would be very very gratifying to me. So what uh, you need to do is write a song. Yeah, right. Well, I don't know. The, the the recording industry isn't doing that well either. I think what what I, what I need to do is like is is find some way to get this on American Idol. Yeah, I'm right. amazed at at how many copies of these alternative uh, treatment books sell. You are talking about a bunch of them. Some of them sell over a hundred thousand copies. You know. Oh yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, you'd be lucky to sell over 100,000 copies. Yeah, my, if I sold over, over 100,000 copies, I, there's no way I would be spending my time on a podcast talking to you guys. <laughs> Maybe you would like to sell 150,000. <laughs> right, yeah. I, you know, I, 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 would be, I would be choosing among, uh, uh, you know, sure. what people I would deign to, 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 to discuss things with. Hey, no, I hey gra gra grassroots, man. Right, yes, right. <laughs> well, no, you know, I mean, I, and it's one of the things I... Uh, you know, uh, Rebecca Sklute's book, um, uh, The Immortal Life of, of Henrietta Lacks, uh, it's one of the reasons that um, I and, and I think so many people, both in the both sci science writers and, and in the scientific community, find that so inspiring. Um, because that's a book that dealt with science in a very serious way. Um, and, uh, and she has found a, a, a huge mass audience. Um, so clearly, you know, the audience is there people, it, it's not as if people are unwilling to read about, um, and to learn about science in, in a serious way. Uh, um, although there, I would say the story, the human story probably is what, is what's selling the uh, book. Absolutely, you know the 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 human story, and, and uh, pe people will will say to me all the time, "Well, you know, oh, well, what did what did Rebecca Sklute do?" And I feel like you know, well, she uh, she became a great writer and a really good reporter, and found an incredible story. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, all those things are true. However, l there are lots of great topics um, uh, that people have written about that either did not get, did not spread the way that did, or uh, didn't address the science in the way that she did. Sure. Um, 
and, and, and she could have written just about the human side of it and not grappled with, with the scientific issues she did. And I think that that's one of the things people find gratifying about that book mm-hmm. um, is that it does deal with some of those issues. Well, your book is very well written, and I hope that that, uh, that gets around because that alone helps – uh, you know, a, bo- a book that's well written and really kind of sucks you in uh, uh, by itself will help spread the word. And I, I found myself, even though I pretty much, well, I know a lot of the story. Actually, you uh, told me a lot I didn't know. But I, the book evolves in a way that gets you because Hastings' decision at the end. Right. Yeah. Is sort of a is sort of a climax. So there was an element to your writing of uh, me feeling like I want to know the answer. How does this turn out? Right. Right. Um, right. Which uh, there's a there's a gotcha to it, which uh, I hope will will help uh, help help set it, help sell it. I so, think it's also it's good. very intelligently written. You explain yes. you explain a lot of complicated things very well. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so. I mean, that, it's it's it's. Thank you both. That's 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 incredibly nice of you to say, and and great to hear. And um, you know, definitely one of the things I wanted to do was to present the whole thing as um, a, as a sort of complete package that people could uh, could 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 really read and 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 feel like this is a story. This is something that um, uh, you, you know, it's not a bunch of just discrete chapters or sections. Um, you know, I, I wrote one book about the Red Sox and, uh, I think it was no secret to anyone who read it that they had won the world series in 2004. Um, but I think that there's always a way to write about stories. Um, even when people know the answer, uh, or the ending that, that has that kind of tension and narrative and, and, and draw. And that's certainly, that's, that's one of the things I try really hard to do. Yeah. And you manage to, you manage to cover it in a, in a balanced fashion where you communicate the pain of the parents of the kids with autism and the passion of the anti-vaccine movement and, uh, the thinking of the scientists at the same time, there's everything in there done, done quite well. Well, I, I mean, really, it's it's it, it's very nice of you to say, and and it it makes me feel feel great to hear it. Yeah, you did it. You did it right. I wanted to uh, read one sentence from your uh, book as a way of asking a question. It's uh, on page two forty eight. We don't care about the science because we know in our hearts that our child got autism from vaccines. So right. This is a theme that we've we've talked about. So, what I would like to know, scientists like Rich and myself, what can we do and others to help uh, this situation? Well, I mean, I think that um, when we're talking in, in this specific instance, when we're talking about parents who believe very strongly that um, this is what they saw happen to their children, um, I, I don't think there's there's anything that that either of you two or me or anyone can do to uh, change their minds, and 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 that's not because you know I think they're delusional or crazy or anything. I I think it's because, um, when you have personal experiences, uh, it's very hard to change your thinking about them, especially when it's something as difficult and emotional as this. I think that who I hope to be able to have a, a conversation with and reach is, you know, is everyone else, which is the vast majority of people. Um, and, and I think one thing, uh, that both the medical and the scientific communities have really neglected for too long is um, the idea that one part of, of their job is communicating with the public. Um, uh, you know, uh, what, what you two are doing with the podcast is you, you don't see in, in, in most disciplines. And, and I think with a lot of scientists, uh, it, that would be seen as, as sort of uh, detracting from the time they can spend in the lab or, uh, or, or doing their other work. Um, you know, I think that there is a responsibility uh, on the part of, of the public health community and the medical community and the scientific community to communicate to the public in a way that the public can understand what it is they're doing. Um, uh, and I think that, you know, just those steps alone could, could go a long way. 
So I I have a, another question that's sort of the flip side of what we just talked about. And we were talking about how uh, when you're stuck on something emotionally, for it's like if you're a, a parent of an autistic kid and you um, are convinced that vaccines caused the condition, you can't get out of that. Right. The flip side is, <clears throat> and you go over this in one of your chapters talking about scientific thinking, the scientific method uh, requires that the scientist uh, dissociate him or herself from a cognitive bias. Okay. Right. Yes. So, right. and and I feel this very intensely as I approach experiments because, of course, you go into an experiment. Well, you have a hypothesis. A hypothesis, in a sense, is a bias, right? You right. think it's going to turn out a certain way, and you get results that say you're wrong. Okay. Not only that, but when you design controls for an experiment, you have to say, well, what if I'm wrong? What if it's right. this instead? What if it's that? So this is a, a, a central skill to the science, being able to step back and dissociate yourself from those biases and uh, accept over and over and over and over again that you're wrong. Being wrong is almost more important than being right. Right. Okay? right. Um, is this something... I, I, I've been doing this all my life, okay? I don't know if I was born with it or not. Is this a, something we learn? <laughs> or, yeah. or, or are people born with it or what? Can we teach I, it? I think it's something that um, if we're aware of the importance of it uh, and if we're conscious of the tendency um, to fight against it, uh, it, it, it's something that we can incorporate much more effectively into into our our lives, and this uh, and this applies not just to scientists. Um, right, it's critical uh, thinking. You know, yeah, well, and and you know, I, I write about uh, about about cognitive biases and, and the ways in which we convince ourselves um, that what we think or do is is based on on reason and not emotion. Um, and I, I think even just being aware of the fact that that is a sort of fundamental part of the human experience um, uh, can help us uh, sort of fight against that instinct. And, and I can give you an example. Um, you know, I, I got an email earlier today uh, from someone who um, uh, there, there's there's sort of a I don't know if you would call it a movement, but there's um, a, a, a strain of thinking within the autism community, um, uh, which is called neurodiversity, that um, autism is not should not be considered a, a disorder, but it's just a uh, it's it's on the range of human experiences, and it's not our position to say whether it's it's good or bad, or and, and even saying that it should be treated is sort of implying that people who have autism are are are, are somehow defective. Um, and and it was a, a, the person who wrote it to me was clearly um, was emotional about the topic. Uh, and, uh, and, and essentially was telling me that in not addressing that, um, that was a failure that, that was a, a failure of my book. Um, and you know, my immediate reaction was, uh, you know, this person's a moron. Um, uh, he or she has no idea what they're talking about. They clearly have never written a book. They don't understand how to build a narrative and, uh, and, 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 you know, how, how could you talk to some of these families whose children are nonverbal and, and tell them that their children don't have a disorder? Uh, you know, when I thought about it, um, uh, I, I, I had to acknowledge to myself that there were a number of valid points that were raised. And I made a series of assumptions about um, how we look at autism uh, and assumed that those were sort of universally true, and they're clearly not. So, um, you know, it, I don't know if I would have done anything differently. I think that's probably a whole other book uh, dealing with neurodiversity, but uh, I don't think that the, that the writer's criticism was off base, and, and, and I don't think that they were uh, necessarily wrong to sort of call me to task for uh, for not addressing that in any, you know, even if it was just in a sentence or a paragraph. So, um, I think that that if I had not spent 
a lot of time thinking about and, and writing about and working on these notions of, of cognitive biases, uh, that, that might have not been my, my reaction because it definitely wasn't my first instinct. Um, but I think it is sort of a, a, a way of looking at things that, that we can train ourselves in. Um, you know, one thing I do, I have like a, I have a 24 hour rule on, on really angry emails. Um, you know, I'll write them and will be very impressed with how incredibly cutting I am <laughs> and, uh, how I just have effectively ripped someone to shreds. And then I will put them in my drafts folder and 24 hours later, we'll go back uh, and, and reread them and decide whether it's a, you know, whether I should send them. Um, it never is a good idea to send them. Uh, I don't think I ever yet have, have sent one of those, one of those emails that I've put in that folder. There have been times when I, when I didn't put an email in that folder and, and should have. Um, but you know, I think that's an example of my sort of trying to, 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 to show myself and to learn that, um, my instincts do, will not always serve me well, and I should do what I can to build in safeguards to uh, to sort of protect me from them. Rich, being aware of it is a big part of the problem. Yeah, you can if you know you're going into an experiment with that bias, you can at least you can try and control uh, it. Right? Absolutely. So we're. But also, yeah. you know, I mean, and 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 you two know this much better than I do. Uh, you know, you don't get rewarded in academia or um, you know, or in the scientific community for. Uh, for proving that something isn't right. I mean, you know, if you go into an experiment with a hypothesis and it turns out, it turns out your hypothesis was wrong, no one's going to give you tenure for that. No. Um, you know, it, you're going to get rewarded for, for proving that, that, that some new conjecture hypothesis is correct. So I think that we need, you know, or we could stand for a shift in thinking uh, on a lot of different levels in, in that regard. I have one more question for you, then we'll, yeah. then we'll do a couple of email and let you go. So you say in the end of the book that you're afraid of vaccines. I wonder if you yes. could talk about that. Uh, uh, well, I mean, it, it's, it's um, I don't know if it's so much that uh, I'm afraid of vaccines is, you know, I have a young son and when I, when I brought him in and when I bring him in to get his vaccines, my visceral reaction is... Um, not, uh, yes, please inject, please stick a needle in my son's arm or in his thigh. You know, uh, you can't tell your infant, um, this is something that's ultimately going to be for your own good. Um, uh, it's, it's conceptually hard to wrap your mind around, uh, that sort of preventative treatment. Um, especially when, when you don't see the, these diseases uh, around you. So, um, you know, I hate, I hate needles. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I, my, my reaction was like, you know, she went out of the room for a second and I was like, all right, now we can, we can make a run for it. Um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, y y you know, I mean, the, the, I, I also, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm much more afraid of, of what are the very real risks. And ultimately my, my fear um, my fear about vaccines is that uh, people won't get them, mm. and that and that you know my son will be one of those one of those children that um, either a, one or another vaccine doesn't isn't effective in, or uh, you know he'll come in contact with with someone before he's been fully vaccinated, or yeah, sure. uh, you know that that's that's what scares me. I'm glad my kids are all grown up and vaccinated because this this scares me that there are microbes around now that shouldn't be because of the low immunization rates. As far as your needle scare goes, I would say that one day we're not going to have any needle delivered vaccines. They'll either be in your nose, oral, or skin patch of some yes, sort. Yes, that's, that's probably true. And, that'll uh, help. That'll, true. Be, that'll help a lot because I remember the first vaccine my our first son got was the first time he ever cried. You know, it was just a little intradermal thing, and he looked at the pediatrician. He's sitting on my lap. He starts crying. Yeah, that's the way it is. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I, I, I still remember when I was five, um, my, my, my father and a doctor needing to essentially hold me down yeah. to, to give yep. me a vaccine. I oh, mean, yeah, I remember that one, too. Uh, Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was like that, that was when I realized what what a jerk my dad was. <laughs> <laughs> I want to end this part with with a quote from your book, which I think is really good. 
and summarizes it up. And you're talking at the end in the uh, epilogue, I believe. You're right. I hope he, and you're referring to your son, grows up in a world where science is acknowledged not as an ideology, but as the best tool we have for understanding the universe and where striving for the truth is recognized as the most noble quest humankind will ever undertake. Yes. Really, I bet you spent a lot of time on that sentence, right? I did. Well, you know, the last <laughs> sentence, it's like I felt like I had to go out with a bang there. That was the last uh, sentence in the book, right? Yeah, yeah. All right. Do you have anything else, Rich? Uh, well, I, yeah, another two or three hours worth of okay. stuff. I'm not sure we touched anything on our on our list. It's here. Right. I, think know, it was I could go good... on forever. It's terrific, just terrific. By the way, what one thing have you, uh, Seth? Have you read um, the making of the atomic bomb by Richard no. Rhodes? Oh yes, I did. But I read it in college. I haven't, I, I, which for me basically means I didn't read it because uh, it, you know, I, f I find it incredibly hard to remember things I read like two weeks later. Never mind, decades. That later. has a, a a a similar sort of flavor at the end where he, uh, after all of this stuff, and it has a lot of ethical uh, issues in it as well. Right. It's a different kind of book, but it has. Uh, a lot of the ethics and the science mixed in. But he uh, communicates a perspective, a very positive and hopeful perspective on science at the end of that book uh, as well, which is kind of what your book uh, did for me, and I was I was thankful for that. That was good. Right, right. Um, yeah, no, I'm sorry. What, what were you going to say? No, that's it. Just I was wondering if you'd uh, read the book. No, but uh, well, I have, but I'll reread it. I'll reread it for sure. It, it's a it's a big one. I don't know if you're going to have time anytime soon. You have a oh, lot I'm of a writing. Big, to do. I, I'm an insomniac, so I do a lot of reading. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I, I I read Taylor Branch's you know eight hundred thousand page history of the civil rights movement when I was working on this. So wow! Uh, Holy cow! Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I actually need to run, but I can give you guys a call back. You want to, you want to do some emails? I just wanted to do two. If you want to, uh, uh, come back, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. What, you want me to, um, why don't I shoot you an email as soon as I get off this other call and that it should be like within 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah. Rich and I will just go ahead. Sure. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll shoot you an email. Thank okay. You. Thanks. Bye. Bye. So Rich, why don't you and I do, uh, some of the other emails until he calls. Yeah. Us. The, the first two are the ones you want, uh. Yeah, you know, I I thought he would be good to yeah, uh, absolutely. answer that. I, I've, held, I've had them for a while, and uh, I didn't know really how to answer them, and so I think he might have. I don't know. Maybe not, but we'll see. Yep. In the meantime, uh, we have one from, from uh, Dong Hoon. Dear doctors, I was so much thrilled when I listened to you read my email on episode 106 about high-throughput screening, the program funded by the NIH. At the same time, I apologize I did not spell out SAR, Structure Activity Relationship. Chemists usually research SAR to make a better compound by looking at chemical structure, target protein, as well if its structure is available and activity of the compounds. Anyway, I would like to have your comments about the evolutionary benefit of natural hosts, if you don't mind. A lot of zoonotic viruses are carried by natural hosts, hantaviruses by rodents and influenza viruses by wild birds, etc. Most of them are asymptomatic in their natural hosts. My question is why the natural hosts carry the viruses instead of removing them. There might be some evolutionary benefits for the hosts. I appreciate your thoughts on this. I really enjoy TWIV every day, and I have to admit that TWIV inspires me so much, not only with science and virology, but also with my social responsibility and attitude as a young scientist. Thank you for your great work. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's very nice. I, I appreciate that's terrific. that. Well, you want to take a shot at this? Uh... Well, uh, so, there, yeah, there's lots of stuff here. First of all, um, as we've said many times before, uh, the viruses in what he's calling the natural hosts uh, establish uh, a sort of a, an equilibrium lots of times where there's... Uh, not a lot of, uh, it doesn't do the host much damage, okay? So there's no downside really for the host necessarily and the virus still gets to uh, replicate. And so under those circumstances, I think you can get a, a persistence over, over eons. But we've also um, uncovered a, or discussed a couple of situations on TWIV where viruses actually can uh, uh, confer a selective advantage to the host. Uh, what was it? Um, there was a, a paper on herpes viruses in an animal model 
uh, conferring resistance to some, I think, bacterial infections. Mm -hmm. um, and so that sort of stuff is possible too. So I would say, you know, two things. One, you can't reach an equilibrium where it's of no particular advantage or disadvantage. It's an advantage to the virus to keep going and no disadvantage to the host to maintain it. And sometimes it's even an advantage. I think basically, you, uh, yeah, you can have um, neutral interactions. You can have advantageous interactions. We've looked at some viruses that control aphid behavior, remember? Mm -hmm. um, they're involved in wasps as well, if you recall. I think anything that works. There are some cases where the virus kills the host, but there are lots where they evolve together and they exist peacefully. And obviously that's just many ways to propagate, and that's what the virus wants to do. Doesn't and it's a anything anything that we describe is a is a snapshot in time. Yeah, that's right. Everything's evolving all the time. We aren't done. I mean, in 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 many of these cases, the the hosts may in fact actually the host may not even be aware that they're infected. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, but they probably are. Okay, you're probably making we're, we've all we're all carrying around polyomavirus in our kidneys, right? Um, that's a a pretty. Uh, in most cases, a totally benign infection. Uh, we all have it. We're probably also making antibodies, right? Yeah. So we're keeping that down. Um, uh, we can't get rid of it completely because the viruses have worked ways around this and can maintain themselves. So there's a there's a tug of war going on all the time, and we can't necessarily get rid of them and. They aren't necessarily doing us any harm. So there you go. I just came across a really nice figure in a review on chronic infections, that is, viruses that are with their hosts for long periods. And one of the high, of course, the highest uh, chronic infection, quote unquote, are the endogenous retroviruses, which are in almost everyone. But the next one are the anelloviruses, these small single stranded uh, yeah. DNA viruses. Apparently, uh -huh. most of the population is seropositive for these guys. And you know what? We didn't even know about it. Yeah. about these things until very recently because they don't cause any disease. Yeah, exactly. But they're all over the place. And then the, then next are the herpes viruses, the EBV, HCMV, and simplexes. They're in a lot of people as well. So I think it would be very interesting to go out in nature and, and trap animals of various sorts and see what kinds of, of viruses are in them and not harming them. I don't, I don't think we've even touched the surface on that question. No, because the, the focus up until, up until we have the techniques... Uh, to really uh, look uh, at, for infection in that sort of an unbiased uh, faction, uh, fashion, the focus has been on disease. Absolutely. Our bias has been disease-causing viruses up till very recently. And, and yeah. perfectly reasonable because the sure. disease you see, yep. it's, it's obvious. You see okay. and you want to prevent what, it, what right? What causes this, yeah. Okay, the next one's from Jamie. I love your show, and I'm one step away from wearing a sandwich board to push it. For now, though, I recommend it by word of mouth. <laughs> well, maybe we should send him a sandwich board or a T-shirt. <laughs> I have a comment regarding Vince's assertion on episode 105 that there is not a functional envelope for HERV-K, the endogenous human retrovirus. He says, in fact, a group at the Pasteur, Thierry Heidman's lab, found that one member of the HERV-K family, HERV-K108, codes for a functional envelope glycoprotein, and when the ARM sequence is cloned into an expression vector and used to co-transfect cells along with a simian immunodeficiency virus helper, the HERV pseudotyped particles mediate infection of a number of cell types, cat brain cells, EU, <laughs> though at a very low level. So that's a long way of saying that this, uh, this gene not only looks like it works, but it can be shown experimentally yeah. that it does work. Yeah, but the rest of the virus is dead, all right? So we don't make these HERV-K particles, but part of it is functional. The same group later reconstructed a full-length HERV-K provirus called Phoenix from a consensus sequence and was able to show infection of a few cell types again at very low levels. Identification of a receptor is probably just around the corner or au coin de la rue. Excellent. And he is correct, and I'll provide a link to the Journal of Virology article uh, for that. Okay, the next one is from Jessica. Hello, Dr. Racaniello, or the lucky grad student that is scanning his emails for him. Not happening, right? No, I've never had anyone scan my emails. No, it's, Have you? You. it's all Vincent. Have you had anyone scan your emails? Heck no. Has anyone? No, nobody does anything for me. 
Well, no, that's not true. I mean, I don't have an assistant or a secretary or anything like that. I process all this stuff myself. Everybody in my lab does wonderful stuff for me all the time. But I'm reading all the emails. It's interesting. Jessica thinks it would be a lucky student who could scan my email. And that's true. You could uh, get all these cool TWIV emails to read. But then you'd get the other one saying, uh, <laughs> where's your grant application? <laughs> Review this paper. All right, let's continue. I am currently taking virology at Montana State University. It is being co-taught by Dr. Mark Young and Dr. Michelle Hardy. They are great. Now, wasn't Michelle our host in Bozeman? Uh, yeah, I believe so. And Mark Young is the guy who goes out and fishes strange bugs out of hot springs and stuff. Ah, yes. Like okay. I've enjoyed your podcast as an added reinforcement to our lectures. I recently listened to number 19 about cap snatching. And in the introduction, you mentioned a photo of a Chinese chicken farmer sleeping with his chickens. You mentioned that there was a high chance of viral exchange via aerosol transmission. Now, I have to admit that my dog does like to sneak up onto my bed, and she is a cuddle bug. My question is, should I be worried that we could be swapping viruses? Should I get my dog a flu shot? Just joking. Maybe a good podcast would be how house animals, especially exotic animals, are affected by the viruses that we introduce them to. Thank you, Jessica. I don't know many uh, viruses that go to dogs or back. Are, we don't really get infected with the dog parvoviruses. We don't get no. infected with dog flu. There are some no. reverse zoonoses uh, in other animals, humans to chimps, for example. So I think you're okay with your dog as far as viruses go. Now, I just did a twip with Dixon about Ascaris, and it turns out that you can get, if your dog is not dewormed, you can get these big worms from them. So make sure you're giving your wor your dog uh, the uh, anti-worm medication, uh, ivermectin or something like that. Anything uh, to add there? No, Rick? I don't think so. You uh, the, the, uh, the amount of interspecies transmission is really pretty limited. If you, if you, if you think about it, you're talking uh, about we, with dogs or in general, uh, in general, mm -hmm. you know, if you think about it, we, uh, interact with a lot of pets and, uh, actually a lot of critters all over the place. Um, and, um, there's not a lot of stuff that gets passed around the zoonos. There's, uh, uh, obvious zoonoses that, um, we've, we've, we've talked about before, but I, I guess if you could enumerate them, you'd find that, um, for the most part, one species keeps its own bugs. Yeah. Uh, I think, pretty you much know, behind a, a, a species barrier. Yeah. Compared to the number of viruses that infect animals, the ones that get to us are very, very few. Right. And my guess is that goes with, you know, there's no bias as to what direction you're talking about, whether it's humans to other yeah. animals or other animals to humans. But I think you're okay with your dog as far as viruses go. Absolutely. Yeah, you're okay. Go keep, for it. Uh, keep good cutting. for you. Uh, the next one's from Attila, who writes... After the mail, I wrote asking about mitochondrial viruses. I have found some interesting things. There are mitochondrial viruses in fungi. They're called mitoviruses, small 2 to 3 kb double-stranded RNA viruses of the Narnaviridae family. And he gives a link for that. Very interesting. Chloroplast, chloroplast may also be infected by viruses, and there is a cool story behind it. There is a sea slug capable of making photosynthesis. It's called Elysia chlorotica capable of stealing chloroplasts from the algae it eats and keeping them under the skin, making photosynthesis for months. Wow. This solar-powered sea slug keeps the chloroplasts functional much longer than they should last outside the algal, algal cell since they need specific proteins that only the algae have genes for. But Elysia chlorotica has stolen these genes and incorporated them into its nucleus. This is spooky. <laughs> it's amazing. And the sea slug has an endogenous retrovirus that has been found both in its nucleus and the chloroplasts, which may have helped to transfer the genes ah. between species. The virus may also regulate the sea slug life cycle as it's found in great numbers when the host dies. That is an amazing story. That is just an amazing story. Hmm. Gives a reference for this. And he says, Alan Dove also mentioned that chloroplast polymerase seems to have a viral origin. Well, our mitochondrial DNA polymerase, too. It's very similar to T4, bacteriophage T4 polymerase. Amazing. Congratulations again for the great podcast. Thank you, Attila. Uh, I'm back. Hey, <laughs> you're just in time. We just finished an email. There you go. Did you know that there are mitochondrial viruses and fungi? 
Uh, <laughs> no, I definitely did not. This is no. amazing. Someone just sent us this email about this, uh, and it's incredible. Okay, uh, welcome back. We wanted, we have two emails that uh, we saved for you. Great. And they're both from the same person, Martin. Now, Martin, uh, at the end of one of his emails, says, I never miss a show. He, he listens to the podcast, and uh, he's told me he's purchased my virology textbook. There you go. That's a real fan. So that's good, and I appreciate that. However, his his emails, uh, let's say, do not reflect that. So okay. <laughs> let's, let's take the first one. He says, okay. So he he sent us this email after our last episode in which we had talked about the Brian Deere uh, story, the most recent one about right. Wakefield. He says, listen to this. It's incredible. He's talking about a podcast. The pharma establishment is stomping on Dr. Andrew Wakefield in the same way they stomped on Peter Duisberg of UC Berkeley. In both cases... Duisburg and Wakefield got it right, and the pharma establishment is shielding gross scientific error because of money. Wakefield's study was not fraudulent and accurately reported that all 12 kids had MMR vaccine-associated digestive tract viral illness that brought on autistic symptoms. The virus doing the damage in the kids' guts years later was found to be the same measles strain that was in the vaccine. The recent news stories slamming Wakefield come from reports by a single corrupt pharma-paid science writer, which the American media has jumped on without checking for accuracy. Be sure to listen to the end of the program where the mother of two kids in the study tells how she tangled with the corrupt science writer. I mean, it, it, it's the... the um, it's, I almost don't know where to begin <laughs> with things like that. And, and I get those a, a, a lot. I mean, essentially... Uh, you know, without having transcribed the whole thing, almost nothing in that email is is accurate. And it, you know, it's a series of of sort of, of of red herrings and and just outright falsehoods. You know, there's there's Brian Deere is the reporter um, if, who wrote this latest series of of stories from the British Medical Journal. He's also the reporter who uncovered. Um, a lot of the original problems with the research in, in 2004. Um, and and uh, to, to, to act as if this is all the work of this one reporter is, um, is, is either delusional or, or, or purposefully uh, uh, dishonest. I mean, there have been stu- you know, studies on the, involving literally millions of children um, uh, about the subject of the MMR vaccine. And I, I just don't understand how it is that Andrew Wakefield is being held up as the, the sort of white knight in this scenario. You know, here's someone who uh, was, had a financial relationship with a law firm that uh, w- w- was, was working with families who were interested in suing, uh, suing over, over vaccine damages for their children. It's someone who had taken out a patent for an alternative vaccine, measles vaccine, that would be precisely what would be used, a single-dose measles vaccine, uh, uh, or not single-dose, not, you know, a, a single measles vaccine not, not tied to the mumps and rubella, if people believe the MMR vaccine wasn't safe. So uh, to paint him a, as, as ethically pure in this um, it just strikes me as, as, as odd. And, and to, to present this as a situation in which the pharmaceutical companies are, are conspiring against him, for that to be accurate, um, it would need to be, uh, you know, the pharmaceutical companies would somehow need to have co-opted every government uh, that, that's looked into this around the world, um, you know, along with hundreds and hundreds of scientists um, uh, medical, uh, you know, every professional medical association, um, doctors, uh, it, it just defies imagination. You know, I, I, I was, as I, as I said earlier, I think I was just on this online chat, um, you know, where, where someone said, why don't you, uh, be honest about all the, uh, you know, the pharma money that you're getting, um, which is just an example of mm, how yeah. complete, you know, I, Simon, uh, Simon and Schuster, if they're owned by Smith Klein Beecham, it's news to me. I mean, um, you know, anyone who wants to come and look at my, my, my bank account and see the absence of pharma funds there, um, uh, can. So, uh, you know, I, I think that shows how this has become a very emotional issue where, for whatever reason, uh, people are 
uh, either choosing to ignore um, uh, the the evidence that's out there, or uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. In that in that case, it doesn't even seem like like misinterpreting evidence. It's yeah. it's 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 just sort of a, a, a not acknowledging the reality of the situation. Well, he seems to have a lot of faith in this Gary Null, who is essentially you know one, an alternative physician type right. who you describe very well in your book others not him specifically i think but uh i don't understand why he would believe gary null as you say as opposed to all the thousands of scientists and just pick up that virology text martin and read it and you'll see that that none of this is, is actually true. i would suggest that martin even just uh simply go to wikipedia and read about gary null i don't know how uh wikipedia manages to uh, maintain itself uh, in its uh, open framework as as balanced as it is but uh, just just as an example from the wikipedia site on gary Nolly he says he is also a promoter of aids denialism the belief that hiv is harmless or does not exist and is not the cause of aids which of course I mean, is the, the peter duesberg story, right there yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, there, there's also there's a sort of disconnect um, uh, that 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 comes up all the time. Where um, anytime there's a quote mainstream scientist, um, you know, a, a scientist at, at at Columbia or Harvard or any place, uh, uh, you know, who who says that vaccines are safe and and these studies have been shown to be wrong, uh, it's because that person is corrupt and has been co-opted by pharma. But then anytime you have even a single scientist who, you know, has a PhD or any association at all with any academic institution, it's like, well, that's proof that that person is therefore uh, reputable. <laughs> it just, it, you know, it, it it's sort of like what's good for the goose is good for the gander. If you're gonna if you're gonna hold up. The fact that Gary Noel has has uh, has any kind of association with with a university, uh, then you need to hold that up against the thousands and thousands of people who think that he's absolutely a hundred percent incorrect. Uh, uh, you know about about any number of things. I mean, the AIDS denialism should be a red flag I mean, because exactly. Peter Peter Duesberg has been. I, I never understood why he did this, why he denied that HIV one causes AIDS. But this is even more cut and dried than vaccine side effects uh, that HIV is the agent of AIDS so anyone who says it's not is just uh, is just wrong uh, Martin's second email says in your last discussion about thimerosal you seem to be unaware that mercury is a nerve poison and he says please check out this letter from the American Academy of Environmental Medicine which is essentially a letter from I assume it's an alternative organization of some sort I've never heard of it and they say, yeah, mercury, we want mercury out of everything. And he says, they are opposed to the use of mercury in any material that is injected into the human body, specifically vaccinations. Do you know which common vaccinations include mercury, especially for children? Yes, I do. None. Uh, uh, you know, they've been removed um, from all of them, which, which also, again, you know, does not does not alter the fact that there have been experiments done uh, uh, and studies done um, uh, I should say studies done uh, about the the safety of the amount of thimerosal that was in um, childhood vaccines, uh, and, and it was shown not to have any any consequences. I mean, it, it you know it, it's that gets to a point um, uh, related to the one about academic institutions. You know, you you'll come across these things like the American Academy of surgeons and and physicians uh and practitioners or something um and then people will point to that saying oh look you know the aapsp uh said this so therefore listen to how many listen to listen to how, <laughs> how many impressive sounding words there are there but then when it's the ama or the cdc or the aap uh well they're they're just corrupt um, you know the 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 issue about mercury, which I agree, sounds very scary. Um, there there's not an acknowledgement that the type of mercury in uh, that had been used um, in, in as a preservative is ethyl mercury, 
um, and not methylmercury, which is the type of mercury that we know is incredibly dangerous to human beings. Uh, you know, the, the, the comparison I make in my book is, um, is ethyl uh, alcohol and methyl alcohol. Uh, you know, one gets you drunk and uh, one kills you. Um, it, you know, you, you add on uh, you 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 add on a sodium or uh, any number of different elements to one active element, and you get something completely different. Um, uh, you know, children are, are get as much mercury every uh, all the time. Infants do um, in in breast milk and uh, certainly in formula um, than they had a decade ago. Uh, in in the entire amount of of, uh, uh, of vaccines on the schedule, I think in tuna uh, fish also there's mercury, right? In tuna fish, yeah, but but you know, I mean, so let's say they don't they don't eat any tuna fish, uh, but they are either drinking breast milk or getting formula, yeah. uh, or else they're starving to death. So, um, I mean, and, and, and one, you know, one final thing uh, um, about that is, you know, I I don't, it almost doesn't make sense to me why there would be this sort of slavish um, holding on to the, the thimerosal hypothesis because if you believe that to be true, then you would also believe that uh, autism rates should have gone down in the decade since it was removed from vaccines. Mm -hmm. And right. they clearly haven't. So, uh, you know, w w what's, what's going on there? Well, you, you, you note this, uh, this writer, I think his name is Kirby. Yes, David he Kirby. Said, yeah. He said, well, we need another two more years to find out the result. We need another four and then more two years. two years, yeah, right. Exactly. As if he had any knowledge of that, as if he has any reason to know that how much time you would need because he has no epidemiology training whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. well, I, what, what he was saying is, you know, uh, autism is, is diagnosed usually by age four or five. So initially what he said, he chose a date that was uh, four or five years after the date at which all of the thimerosal had been removed from vaccines and said, if rates don't go down by that point, then we'll know. Right, um, right. And then when they didn't, he, you know, it was a series of other explanations. I think, I think the only vaccine that has thimerosal is the multi-dose uh, flu injected nowadays. I think it still um, remains in there, isn't that... Is I, I, I'm not sure if it's a multi-dose, um, uh, but, but it, it, it's there is there are some variations of the flu vaccine that still contain thimerosal, but not all right. all variations. Of and vaccine. you can always ask for the you can flu ask mist. for the thimerosal free. Yes, yeah, flu right. mist or the thimerosal free, and right. so you'll be all yes. set. Seth, thanks so much. We'll let you go now. Uh, thank you. Um, it, it was great to be here. Yeah, take, taking time to, to join us. You can find Seth at sethmanukin.com. And I hope you, your book does great. The best of luck with it. Thank you so much. And, Thank you, uh, Seth. Thanks a hopefully lot. Hopefully I'll, I'll talk to you guys again. Anytime you want to come on and talk about something, just let us know. Yeah, okay, I got great. another two, three hours worth of questions. Well, you know, I, well, I, I'm happy to schedule something else. When, so, you yeah. are, uh, when, you're, when your time settles down, uh, that'd be great. Uh, I hope that you're going to be so busy um, uh, because of the success of this book that you won't have any time for us. So good <laughs> right. luck. Well, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Take care, guys. Bye. That's great. Oh, he's terrific. I think he's a smart guy, and uh, yep. I hope the book sells. Yeah. Uh, and, in fact, that will be our pick of the week, right? Absolutely. We'll double double on this one. And Because uh, I think every listener should go out and purchase the, the Panic Virus subtitle, A True Story of Medicine, Science, and Fear. And I love this quote on the cover by Jonathan Mahler. He says, a nonfiction story worthy of Michael Crichton, an absorbing, disturbing, and scrupulously researched account of a contagion of human unreason run wild. Yep. Wow. That was great. So that's our pick of the week, both Rich and I. First time ever on Twitter of a double pick of the week, The Panic Virus by Seth Mnookin. And I'm glad he could join us. I wonder if we could get for an image the um, complete virus that he's got on the cover there oh, that's it's not not any virus i've ever seen it's a very fanciful virus but it'd be oh nice yes to have for an image. i have i think i was going to ask them but um i think they probably did that on purpose right uh, who knows because the I, title refers to a not a real virus but a yeah. virus of panic right yeah i was going to ask him too where the title of the book came from whether that's his or 
or his publisher or whatever. But at any rate, I, like good. I said, I could I could talk to him forever. Yeah, it's he's good a good fun. guy to good talk fun. to. Good fun. And I think that will do it for another TWIV. You can find us uh, on Facebook. We have a fan page, facebook.com slash thisweekinvirology, all one word. You can go there and get to know us a little better. And as always, you can listen at iTunes, the Zoom Marketplace, twiv.tv, or on your mobile device, either with, uh, well, you could try the Microbe World app, which works on the Apple devices, or any Android device. If you like TWIV, tell others about it. Links and reviews in iTunes are particularly helpful. Send us your questions and comments, of course, TWIV at TWIV.TV. Hey, Rich, good to have you again. Uh, it's always a great time. This was this was fantastic. What a wonderful deal. Yeah, this is cool, and I'm glad. Good fun. But I'll bet if he sold 100,000 copies, he'd still find time for TWIV. Uh, yeah, well, maybe, you know, maybe uh, out there somewhere in the future, TWIV will be on being on TWIV will be on the top of everybody's list of things they want on their bucket list. Should be. Right? Yeah, the more people do it, the more people <laughs> hear about it. What the heck? It's good science, right? Rich is at the University of Florida home of the Gators, bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash poxdoc. And I am Vincent Racaniello at virology dot W-S. You have been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.